your friends from the National Endowment for the Arts, please welcome Wendy Clark. Thank you, Christine. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. I'm Wendy Clark, and I'm dialing in today from my home in Ann Arbor, Michigan, the land of the, of the Anishinaabe and the Wyandot. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a white woman with short blonde highlighted hair wearing a pink top. I've got glasses that will come on and off my face as I read. I'm the director of museums, visual arts, and indemnity at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm joined today by some of my colleagues who will introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Erin Whaler, and I'm joining you from my home in Washington, D.C., ancestral land of the Piscataway and Anacostan, and Anacostan peoples. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a white woman with red glasses, medium length brown hair, wearing a black top and a red and turquoise colored necklace. I'm a coordinator for the artist communities, folk and traditional arts, and presenting a multidisciplinary works programs here at the NEA. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenny Terman. I'm at home today in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, the ancestral land of the Shawnee and Massawamic. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a white woman with short brown hair and brown eyes wearing a blue shirt. I'm the artist communities and presenting and multidisciplinary work specialist at the NEA. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel McKean. I am zooming in from my home in Washington, DC, the land of the Piscataway and Anacostan. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am a white woman with long brown hair and I'm wearing a light blue blouse. Thank you. So welcome everyone, we're happy you're here and we'll give a presentation and there will be time to answer questions afterwards. To start off, here's a little bit about us. The NEA was established in 1965 as an independent federal agency. We are the only arts funder in the United States, public or private, that supports the arts in all 50 states, Washington, D.C., and the U.S. territories of American Samoa, Guam, Northern Mariana Islands, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Each year, in support of our mission, we fund projects in every congressional district to strengthen communities through the arts. While the NEA is a grant-making agency, there are other services that we provide as well. First, we manage a robust portfolio of national initiatives such as the NEA National Heritage Fellowships and Poetry Out Loud. Second, arts research is a core function of the Arts Endowment. Our Office of Research and Analysis regularly releases reports sorry, on arts participation and economic vitality on both the national and state levels and annually awards research grants to other organizations. You can always find our evaluations and studies online at arts.gov. And I recommend you take some time and look, there's a lot of resources there. There are a lot of other free resources like podcasts, blogs, and magazine publications through our, our Office of Public Affairs. We also offer artistic discipline specific broadcasts and newsletters. And by disciplines, we mean media arts, visual arts, theater, music, um, and dance, et cetera. But today we'll be focusing on our grant programs. So by law, 40% of available arts endowment funds are de designated to go directly to the arts agencies in every state and territory and the six regional arts organizations, Arts Midwest, Mid-America Arts Alliance, Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation, 
New England Foundation for the Arts, South Arts, and the Western States Arts Federation. Through these partnerships, we are able to make the arts available in many more communities through a greater variety of grant programs and initiatives and a strong network. The other 60% of the NEA's grant making budget is designated for nonprofit organizations, units of state or local governments or federally recognized tribal communities or tribes. Jenny will now go over some information about our principal grants program. or GAP for short, is the National Endowment for the Arts primary grant program providing comprehensive and expansive funding opportunities for communities. Through, pro through project-based funding, the program supports public engagement with the arts and arts education, the integration of the arts with strategies promoting the health and well-being of people and communities, and for the improvement of overall capacity and capabilities within the arts sector. We encourage projects that support the agency's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as projects that elevate artists and makers as integral and essential to a healthy and vibrant society, celebrate the nation's creativity and or cultural heritage, and facilitate cross-sector cross collaborations that center the arts at the intersection of other disciplines, sectors, and industries. We seek projects that contribute to healthy and thriving arts ecosystems and arts infrastructures, invest in organizational capacity building and leadership development for arts organizations, arts workers, and artists, and build arts organizations capacity to serve a broad public through digital or emergent technology. We also encourage projects that originate or, or are in collaboration with constituencies that include tribal colleges and universities, American Indian and Alaska Native tribes, and Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. These are all further encouraged by White House executive orders. These grants range from $10,000 to $100,000. All grants require a, at least a one-to-one -one non federal cost share or match. The cost share may be any combination of cash and or in-kind third-party contributions. The majority of our direct grants go to nonprofit tax exempt 501c3 organizations. However, we also support federally recognized tribal communities, as well as local government agencies, educational institutions, and nonprofit colleges and universities. There are no limits on the size of your organization, nor the phase of your project. You can apply for uh, projects that include planning, research, and or trainings that build capacity. Every applicant to the National Endowment for the Arts must have certain registrations in place in order to be eligible to submit a proposal. The organization must maintain each registration so that it remains active. These registrations include a SAM.gov registration, SAM stands for System for Award Management, and it's the mechanism through which grantees receive their funds if a grant is awarded. While registration is lengthy, it's definitely doable. So you, you must have this set up even before you apply for a grant. You must also have a grants.gov registration, which is the clearinghouse platform the entire federal government uses to process applications for grants and other awards. Both of these registrations are free. There are a lot of scams and phishing campaigns out in the world for organizations to pay for these registrations, but that is not something you'll ever have to do. So make sure you are registering directly through SAM.gov and Grants.gov and not through a third party. 
SAM.gov and Grants.gov also have dedicated help desk and technical assistance support that is free to access. So if you're considering applying, go ahead and begin the registration process now. All applicants must have at least three years of arts programming history, and it's okay if programming took place before your organization received 501c3 status. All of our awards for organizations require a one-to-one -one, non federal match or a cost share, as I mentioned earlier. So for example, an organization receiving a $10,000 grant from the Arts Endowment must provide at least $10,000 towards the project from non-federal sources for a $20,000 project total. The cost share may come from a combination of cash and third-party contributions. Grants from private foundations, donations from individual donors, income from ticket sales, and a release from your general operating funds are all examples of things that can be used towards the match. We also accept in-kind resources towards the match. Sometimes it can be tricky to assess the value, but for example, say you get a facility donated for a performance that you would usually have to rent. The donation of space to use for free can be counted towards your match. A frequently asked question is whether the match has to be in hand at the time of the application. It does not. However, we do ask you to indicate from where you anticipate requesting and receiving funds. With few exceptions, an organization can submit one application per calendar year to the National Endowment for the Arts Grants for Arts Projects opportunity. We have two application deadlines every year one in February and one in July. You can choose to apply at either the, full, the February or July deadline, but not both. Our next deadline is July 6th, so coming up in just about a month. An expanded list of projects that we do not fund are published in the guidelines on our website, but here are a few examples. Please note we cannot fund commercial activities, so this would include things like the sale of concessions, food, merchandise, artwork, etc. Additionally, we can't fund the construction, purchase, or renovation of facilities. We also don't provide direct grants to individuals. We expect to see artist fees in project budgets, but artists can't be the applicant of record. So one takeaway is we do fund arts projects or specific components of arts projects only, and we do not fund the full seasons or general operating support. Applications receive three levels of review over the course of a nine to 12 month process. The first level of review is completed by a peer review panel, which is made up of experts and professionals in the field. Panels are representative of the broad range of applicants and are diverse in terms of geography, race, gender, disability status, and expertise. Panel recommendations are then submitted to the National Council on the Arts, which is kind of like the NEA's board. The council then makes its recommendations to the chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, who provides the final review and approval of funding recommendations before grants are awarded. So let me just give you a quick timeline example. Um, if you were to submit an application at the July deadline coming up, those applications would be reviewed by a panel of experts in December of 2023. And then those recommendations would go to our March uh, National Council on the Arts meeting in March of 2024. And applicants would be notified of their application status in April of 2024. And finally, the earliest project start date for those applications that were um, offered funding would be June 1st, 2024. When you're composing your application, you want to keep the review criteria in mind. 
The full definitions for these review criteria are on our website, so you can reference them when completing your application. First, artistic excellence speaks to the quality of the artists and other key individuals, creative process, works of art, organizations, arts education providers, artistic partners and or services involved in the project and their relevance to the audience or communities the project aims to serve. Now, we acknowledge that the word excellence is loaded. We approach this idea with the understanding that excellence manifests differently across different art forms and communities. And we encourage panelists to interpret excellence based on the applicant's definitions. Second, artistic merit. This encompasses things like the value and appropriateness of the project to the organization's mission, artistic field, artists, audience, community, and or constituency the ability to carry out the project, clearly defined goals, and evidence of direct compensation to artists and makers. Additional criteria include the ability to strengthen the arts sector through knowledge sharing and resources. And finally, engagement with individuals whose opportunities to experience the arts are limited by geography, race or ethnicity, economics or disability. And now Rachel will walk you through application deadlines and navigating our website. Thank you, Jenny. So on this slide, you'll see the dates for our next Grants for Arts Projects deadline. Um, as Jenny mentioned, we have two opportunities to apply to this grants program each year, um, and both are a multi-step process, which I'll discuss in just a few moments. Um, part one of the upcoming application is due by July 6th. Um, the opportunity is already posted in grants.gov um, and can be submitted anytime between now up until July 6th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. Um, part two is open for a specific window of time, uh, July 11th through July 18th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. Um, please note that this is for projects that will start on or after June 1st, 2024. Um, if you plan to wait and apply to the February deadline next year, those applications will be, will be for projects that start on or after January 1st, 2025. Um, so we know that's a lot of dates. Um, so here's uh, the timeline for next year's February deadline. Um, it follows that same multi-step process as this year's July deadline. The guidelines for next year's applications won't be posted until later this year in December, um, so we don't have the specific dates for the deadlines yet, but you can check back on our website in about December and you should see those there. So within this multi-step process, you'll be using a few different websites as Jenny covered before, prior to starting part one um, of the application process in grants.gov, you'll want to make sure that you have an up-to-date registration with both grants.gov as well as sam.gov. Part one of the application process is submitting via grants.gov the short organizational form or SF424 which is a very brief form that basically collects your organization's legal name, address, and contact information. You'll want to submit this form as soon as possible um, in case you encounter any issues. Um, you really don't wanna miss that July 6th deadline. Part two of the application is where you'll submit the bulk content of the application, um, including the project narrative, budgets, and work samples. Only those who have submitted part one um, will successfully will be able to move on to complete part two. And then part two is done in the applicant portal, which is a website platform managed by the National Endowment for the Arts. So NEA staff will be able to assist you in that part two process. You should follow the guidelines on our website to prepare your application. 
and see what kinds of instructions are specific to the discipline under which you're applying. Um, and then there are also several webinars and tutorials on our website for your reference. Um, I'm now gonna show you how to navigate the website and find links for the application process on arts.gov. So from the main landing page of arts.gov, you'll see a, top, a tab on that top bar called Grants. When you click on it, you'll see a drop-down menu of our various grant opportunities, um, where you, and you can select the relevant grant program. So for this presentation, we're gonna select uh, Grants for Arts Projects as an example. Now you'll see a list of resources on the left-hand side. You'll find instructions, FAQs, resources, deadlines, and the artistic disciplines. The how to apply button on the left will walk you through each step of the application process. When you scroll down to the bottom of this page, you'll see a section on application instructions, and then each of the discipline links to a unique PDF um, of part one and part two of application instructions. So even though you can't submit your part two until July 11th, you can review all the questions ahead of time and prepare your materials. The discipline specific instructions provide the questions that you'll find in the applicant portal once that opens on July 11th. Uh, and there's a lot of really useful information in these PDFs. Um, so we definitely recommend reading through them while you prepare your application materials. Um, the PDF provides information, including character count limits, what the budget forms will look like, um, and descriptions of the application sections. Since all the disciplines use the same applicant portal platform, um, the PDFs provide useful discipline-specific guidance. Um, and if you ever have questions about these guidelines, uh, please contact NEA staff for assistance. Um, so the following are some insights from the panel review process about what does and does not um, resonate with our panel of reviewers. Um, if applicable, competitive projects will um, first and foremost respond to the review criteria um, that we discussed previously in this presentation. Um, project applications will demonstrate alignment with the NEA's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, additionally, we recommend steering clear of jargon or at the very least define language that may be specific to your organization or your project um, and that the panel may not be familiar with. Related, demonstrate thoughtful and intentional strategies to increase diversity and equitable practices. This means ensuring that your application isn't just throwing out key terminology, but highlighting how you're including these strategies into all stages of the project. Um, and then finally, describe clear goals and ways of measuring those goals. And so now I'm going to pass it over to Aaron Whaler, who is going to highlight another grant op opportunity that we offer. Thanks, Rachel. Although Grants for Arts Projects is our primary grant program through which we fund most arts projects, we do have a few other grant programs, and one in particular we'd like to highlight is called Challenge America. This funding opportunity offers support primarily to primarily small entities for projects that extend the reach of the arts to populations that are underserved. Challenge America can be a really good entry point for organizations seeking NEA funding. It offers an abbreviated application and a robust structure of technical assistance outlined on our website. These grants are for a set amount of $10,000 and also require a cost share or match of at least $10,000. In case you were wondering what is meant by underserved populations, our legislation and agency policy defines underserved 
as populations whose opportunities to experience the arts are limited by geography, ethnicity, economics, or disability. In addition to the basic eligibility requirements we already outlined for the Grants for Arts Projects opportunity, Challenge America has some additional eligibility requirements. To be eligible, the applicant organization can be a first-time applicant to the NEA or a previous NEA applicant that was not recommended for funding under any other NEA grant program in any of the most recent, three most recent fiscal years. And you may also be a previous Challenge America grantee. NEA grantees and grant programs other than Challenge America, CARES Act, or American Rescue Plan from the three most recent fiscal years are not eligible to apply to the Challenge America opportunity. Uh, all of the NEA staff presenting this webinar today work primarily in the Grants for Arts Projects opportunity. Uh, so if you have questions specifically about Challenge America funding, we encourage you to reach out to the Challenge America staff who are happy to help you. And their contact information is posted here on the screen. It's challengeamerica at arts.gov. And you may also reach them at 202-682-5700. Finally, we'd like to offer some helpful hints that apply to any of our grant programs. In general, start everything as early as possible and give yourself plenty of time. The earlier you contact us, the better assistance we can provide. As you may imagine, things can get very hectic right before our big deadlines. If you are already registered as at grants.gov and sam.gov, of, check to make sure your registration won't expire before the deadline for which you are applying. Another hint is that you can always access uh, our recent grants to the grant search tool on our website. This be, may be helpful to see what sorts of organizations and projects we have been funding and at what funding levels. You can also access sample application narratives from recent successful applications in the applicant resources section of our website. Another really helpful thing is requesting panel feedback. You can request panel feedback on both recommended and rejected applications. After you are notified of the status of your application, we encourage applicants to request feedback as it can really help improve your next application. And finally, contact us with any questions. We want to hear from you, and we are eager to assist you throughout the process. Uh, a few more things. Don't assume the panel is familiar with your organization or community. Our panels are made of up of people from all over the country with expertise from across the arts sector, including a range of artistic disciplines and practices and administrative roles. Choose a project that exemplifies what you do best as an organization so that you can make the most persuasive case for why your project is worthy of support. It may be helpful to answer the questions, why this project, why now, you need to help build your case. We do recognize that you're applying for these awards almost a year in advance of when they will actually take place, but we do encourage you to provide as much detail as, as possible. For instance, uh, list artists under consideration, even if they are not com confirmed. If details and work samples from your proposed artists are not available yet, provide examples of what your organization has done in the past. Use both your organizational and project budgets as an opportunity to tell your story and what you value as an organization. Make sure that your budget and your narrative align and tell the same story. And we would love to have you 
uh, serve as a panelist. Serving as a panelist gives you an inside view of the panel review process. And if you are interested, please, please, please email us and we will provide our contact information at the end of the presentation. I have some work sample tips for you too. Make sure you are following the work sample instructions in the part two PDF uh, that is specific to the grant program and discipline to which you are applying, as the guidance does differ among different programs and disciplines. Work samples should add an additional layer of understanding to your project. While we do have parameters you must follow, the work samples you submit, submit should be tailored to your specific project and will vary from applicant to applicant. What these samples include depends on your project. For example, if you provide arts education, um, provide samples of your teaching artists. Make sure that your work samples are closely connected to the project for which you're applying. And we do encourage you to carefully self-curate the work samples. Don't overwhelm the panelists with too many work samples and too many materials. Their time is limited. So be sure to follow the work sample limits outlined in the application instructions. Include some recent samples and specific instructions for review. If you have any questions about work samples, again, a reoccurring theme here, please reach out to staff. And now Wendy will provide some information specific to Native Arts and Culture. Thanks, Erin. Before we get into the questions, um, I want to draw your attention to a section of our website that includes information and resources related to Native Arts and Culture. And you'll find it under the impact tab on our homepage, and we'll also drop the link in the chat. This section of our website includes links to our recently published tribal consultation policy, as well as links to other publications like our guide to federal resources for native arts and cultural activities, and a report on the 2020 national convening Native Arts and Culture, Resilience, Reclamation, and Relevance that was hosted by us, the NEA, as well as the National Endowment for the Humanities and Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. The contact information for the four of us who presented today is right here. Really want you to reach out if you need any and more information. And I wanna reiterate Aaron's suggestion, we would love to have people volunteer to be panelists. So it's always best to troubleshoot up front. So make sure you do reach out if you have questions and then um, that way you'll be best prepared for making your application. Erin is now going to moderate a question and answer session based on questions you've provided us. If we don't have a chance to get to your question, we will respond or you can, he don't hesitate to reach out directly to contact any of us. I think we'll have enough time, but that's just what we want you to know. Feel free at any time to reach out. Okay, Erin, how's it look? Do we have some questions? We do, Wendy. All Yay. right. Uh, so first question, who will be reviewing my application? Jenny, do you want to answer this one? Sure, I'm happy to answer this one. So um, I mentioned that there would be a panel of experts in the field that will review all the application. And um, there's typically between four and six panelists on each panel. Um, our panels are divided into the different disciplines that um, we mentioned. Um, I don't think we listed all of them, but you know, for example, there's 
dance, theater, music, visual arts, design, media arts. Uh, I work in presenting in multidisciplinary works and artist communities. There's folk and traditional arts. So a whole host of what we call disciplines. Um, and the reason why we have those different uh, disciplines is so that we can find panelists with those expertise that um, can, can review, uh, do a fair review of those applications um, with that focus. So um, the panelists always include, uh, we're congressionally mandated to have one layperson on each panel. And a layperson for our purposes is someone who is knowledgeable about the arts, but does not make their living in the arts. Um, and then uh, the other panelists on the panel will have expertise in, in that specific discipline that uh, the panel that they're on. So if it's a dance panel, those panelists are going to um, be experts in dance. If it's uh, presenting in multidisciplinary works, we have a broad range of panelists that have um, expertise in, in different disciplines for, for those panels. So that's just an example. Um, one thing we always like to remind applicants uh, about is if you're applying for a grant, um, just compose your application um, in a way that you know doesn't assume that the panelists know anything about your project or your application or your community, um, because these are panelists. They're um, geographically and dem demographically diverse all over the country. So I hope that helps answer the question. Yes, thank you, Jenny. Um, Wendy, another question has come in that is uh, the question is. Is this only for nonprofits? Oh, uh, no, it's not only for nonprofits. Um, the applications can be submitted by units of state and local government, federally recognized tribes and tribes. And while the preponderance might come from organizations with a 501c3, um, you know, we, rec we, we are available to those other units of government, as well as tribes and federally recognized tribes. Um, thanks, Wendy. Jenny, along those lines, uh, we have a question. What if the organization uses a 501c3 arts agency as a fiscal sponsor, but is not a not a nonprofit entity itself. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So unfortunately, we do not fund um, projects through fiscal sponsors. The applicant on record has to be the organization to manage the, if grants are awarded, the applicant on record would be the organization to manage those funds and would have to be integrally involved in carrying out the project. So we don't um, award funds that are going to be like pass, pass through funds, what we call. Um, so, you know, if you are a fiscally sponsored organization, um, I would encourage you to partner with an organization um, that, you know, you're both working collaboratively on the project and the, the eligible organization as a partner could apply. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, Rachel, the next question, if you can help us with this one. Mm -hmm. How can I apply for several smaller projects my tribe undertakes? Um, yes, so you can apply. It does not have to be one large project. Um, it can be components, but it can't be, it has to be a project. It cannot be kind of a season or um, let's see. And I can, Jenny can jump in here as well because it looked like she might have a comment. Um, no. <laughs> um, um, but the short answer is um, yes, it just, it can't be um, seasonal funding. It has to be kind of a project with, with an, an end, if that makes sense. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Um, another question we've received, Jenny, uh, can multiple people be working in Greenstack of and the part two 
platform to complete our package. Okay, that's a good technical question. Um, so yes, multiple people from one organization can work in those different platforms. However, we always warn against um, multiple people from one organization working in those platforms at the same time, um, especially in the applicant portal, uh, your, which is part two of the application process where you'll submit the bulk of your application through the NEA applicant portal. If there's multiple people from one organization working in it at the same time, the information often does not save. So just make sure that you're coordinating with your coworkers to um, work at uh, different times. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, another question that we have is, do you have any tips about work samples? Wendy, can you help us with this one? Sure. Um, so as we referenced before, the work sample requirements are going to be different for, let's say, a dance application than a visual arts project. But what you want to do is read. First of all, make sure you understand what they're asking for, like the length of a of a link you might send or the number of, of images and how they're presented. Um, we don't really want individual JPEGs, for instance, with visual arts. We would want a PDF prepared if possible, but you can always consult with the specialist if some of if that's difficult or you know it doesn't quite serve your needs. But what would apply to everyone, every every application is really you want to be really clear about what the work samples, how they relate to what you're proposing. And that might sound like, of course, that's what we'll do. But often um, you don't want panelists to be guessing, like, is this the artist they've chosen or is this a representative sample of past work and you're commissioning them for something new? Um, so we do want you to pay attention to the quality. Um, and you know, put your best foot forward. And again, ask for help if, if it's confusing. Thanks, Wendy. Um, Jenny, another question that's come in is, um, we have a, a tribe or organization who undertakes community arts. Are those projects available? Okay, yeah. So as long as it's an eligible applicant, as we um, described in our presentation, um, pretty much, you know, a huge variety of arts projects are eligible um, for funding. And so um, with, you know, a few exceptions that um, we mentioned a few in the presentation of, of certain costs or project types that we are not able to fund. And I'll actually just um, put those in the, the q and A. I I think I can do that here. Um, so you can check on our website for the full list. Um, but yeah, so many different types of projects, just for example, um, commissions of artworks, artist residencies in schools or cultural organizations, um, you know, projects about traditional life ways for tribal communities, exhibits, radio broadcasts, festivals, concerts, you know, performances, plays, even powwows, um, all types of projects. As long as there's arts <laughs> related, um, you can submit those for uh, funding. Hey, Erin. Yes. Um, I guess I wanted to add a couple more specific things about the work samples. Mm -hmm. um, like we, if you have a performing arts project, don't submit still images. We really, the panelists will be looking for audio and sound and, um, you know, sometimes video. And we're not looking for slick promotional videos and other materials that are more general because we don't, that doesn't indicate enough of the artists or the makers work. Thanks, Wendy. 
We also received a question about um, if the PowerPoint will be available for distribution to participants after the session. And I will just answer, we're not going to provide the slide deck as a PowerPoint, but we are going to post the, this archived webinar on our website. So uh, look for it there. I'm also going to uh, put in the chat the link to become a panelist, you can also sign up online as well as reach out to us. Another question we've received, and we're, we're wrapping it up. So if anyone has any uh, last minute questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A. Um, Jenny, will you please remind me of the earliest start date for the projects being accepted at the next deadline? Sure, yeah. So the next deadline uh, we mentioned is July 6th. That's when part one of the two-part process is due. And for those applications received at the July 6th deadline, the earliest project start date will be June 1st of 2024. So it is almost, you know, a full year process. It is very, um, it's a thorough and rigorous process. So it does take time. Right. Well, we have come to the end of our questions. If Wendy, you want to um, leave us with a couple final thoughts? Sure. I just want to thank you so much for, for attending this. I know sometimes it's a lot of information. It can be kind of overwhelming and sometimes it's not that exciting either. But I do want you to really take us at our word that you should reach out if you have questions and um, you're in really good hands. Um, I am um, temporarily helping out with this, uh, with the Native Arts Engagement and Working Team. And um, as you can see, Jenny and Aaron and Rachel are available and um, very professional and very approachable. So I want you to feel free to reach out to us. And um, thank you so much for attending. And we look forward to seeing applications from some of you who've attended today. Signing off. Take care. Thank you, everyone.